I will walk the path, I will run the race, and I will never be the same again. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Amen. It's been a challenging week. The Queen, the Queen of England, passed away. And at least part of uh, humanity is mourning. Many good things are said these days about the one that was Elizabeth II. Does anybody know what Elizabeth II, what her favorite flowers are? No? Beautiful flowers, flowers from the Bible, flowers that in the Bible represent or symbolize the church of God. No? Rose? That one too. That one too. Let me show it to you. What's this? As the lily of the valley. And uh, you may even remember some songs in which the lily of the valley appears. Well, I wish this smelled. The only problem is it doesn't have life. It's kind of fake. Still looks beautiful. I, I wish I could find the real deal and uh, bring to you the real smell of the lily of the valley. Because that smell, man, that smell is sweet. So good. When I was a child, we would go out and uh, pick those flowers from right there, from the valley. Because uh, in that area where I grew up, there were valleys where the lily would grow, the lily of the valley. I was in high school, and during my high school years, I lived in the house of an elderly woman, Grandma Susie. She kind of adopted me as one of her grandchildren, and I adopted her as my grandmother, because my grandmas had passed away by that time. And one day, in her little kitchen, the house was really small. She would call it my little shack. And uh, one day she opened the cabinet door of her kitchen cabinets, green kitchen cabinets, uh, something you cannot forget. And I saw a bottle there, a glass bottle, that had the picture of the lily of the valley on it. I suspected in the bottle there must be something good smelling. But uh, I didn't have the courage to ask her to give it to me to smell it. So uh, I thought, well, one day when she will not be in the house, I will become Snoopy and uh, take a good, because I wanted the smell. You know, if you grow up picking lilies from the valley, you want that smell. So one day she was uh, not in the house, and I uh, uh, carefully went to the cabinet, opened the door, it was right there. We didn't have to room around. It was right there. I took that bottle. And, you know, today a perfume has uh, that sprayer kind of thing. This was different. This was good old uh, Eau de Cologne. Uh, it was uh, a bottle 
that had that uh, whole plug, you know? So I took a knife to get that plug out so I can get a real smell, you know? The fragrance of the bottle. And when I was trying to get the plug out, the plug jumped out and a good amount of that liquid came on me. <laughs> now you hide what you did. <laughs> I had to come, out, come up with some explanation because uh, uh, after a little while, Grandma Susie came back in the house and uh, as soon as she stepped in, she stopped. Yeah, I came up with an explanation that didn't smell as good as the lily of the valley. <laughs> yeah, perfume. Everybody likes, well, with some little exceptions when somebody may be allergic to some perfumes, but perfumes, they are desirable. You would like to smell a good perfume when somebody passes by and there's a good perfume coming from there or if uh, you have the chance to pick a good and expensive perfume. Oh, perfumes are expensive. Even if you get a chance for somebody else to pay for it, it can be still expensive. I read a funny story the other day. They broke into a uh, perfume factory of Chanel in France. Six people broke into the factory and uh, the police was alerted they came out so they caught them in flagrante and one of them when was asked uh, so what was, were you planning to do with the perfumes he said well, I don't care about the perfumes I, all I wanted is the wooden um, crates the wooden things on which those uh, perfumes were that's what he wanted you, you were like, oh, why, really? So uh, you broke into the factory to get the, the crates? Yeah. Perfumes are expensive. They, they wanted to make money. But what if you are in a love relationship and uh, the one that loves you and you love takes you to a perfume store and you get a chance to pick a sweet smelling perfume, what would you pick? The perfume that you like or the perfume that he or she likes? Come on. If you really love that person, are you going to pick the perfume that you like or the perfume that he or she. Are you going to smell good for you? Come on, after a few days you can't even smell your own perfume. Isn't that true? So if you are in a love relationship, what perfume are you going to pick? Yeah, his or her, right? But let me ask you, if you pick the right perfume, pick the right perfume, and then you never use it, or you use it so sparingly that the one that loves you never feels it. Or you use it alternately, alternately with a perfume that the one that loves you cannot stand. Now the question, are you still in a love relationship? Pick the right perfume and use it. Same book of Ephesians. Oh, smells good. The lily of the valley smells good. What I put on it. See, that's the difference. Because there can be perfume put from the outside. There is a perfume that comes from the inside. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 starting with verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God 
as dear children, as loved or beloved children, I'm underlining that or emphasizing loved children because in the next verse, verse 2, the word love appears again, and walk in love, same agape, so you children loved or beloved, beloved, walk in love as Christ also has loved, again, a third time, us, and given himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for or into a sweet-smelling aroma. You can use perfume. Yes? As Christ has loved us and given himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for or into a sweet-smelling aroma, a sweet-smelling perfume. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus being such an offering and such a sacrifice of a sweet-smelling perfume. May we also be like him in his name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. An offering and a sacrifice. Is there a difference between the offering and the sacrifice? Jesus' life was an offering of a sweet-smelling perfume. Jesus' death was a sacrifice of sweet-smelling perfume. Walk in love says the Apostle Paul, as Christ, just like Him. This is the same that Christ says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the way, Jesus says. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians expresses that same idea of Jesus postulating himself as being the way on which to walk because Jesus became a walk or a way to walk on so that we can indeed walk on it. Some people think Jesus became a way that nobody can walk. No. The Apostle Paul in various ways explains us what it means to walk like Jesus. Walk in the good works, he says, that God prepared in advance so that you walk in them. Walk in the truth as it is in Jesus. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And now he says, walk in love. And then th he explains, he gives some examples of what it means to walk in love. Because this is how to imitate God himself. When somebody walks like Jesus, or when somebody walks in Jesus, or somebody walks, if you want, on Jesus, when somebody walks these ways, as the Apostle Paul expresses them, it is like giving God, this is the picture and I love it, it is like giving God a bouquet of the lily of the valley. And God says, hmm, I love it. This smells so good. It is like giving God a bottle of sweet perfume. And God says, yeah, I love it. This smells just like, just like whom? When you give God a bouquet of lilies of the valley or a bottle of sweet perfume, what does God the Father say? This smells just like, 
just like Jesus Christ, my son. And he goes on in chapter 5, verse 3, and then he contrasts love with what, what we could express in one single word as lust. Love and lust. He says, but fornication, and the word in the Greek language is porneia, and all uncleanness or covetousness, the Greek says pleonexia, and we have that word in English, believe it or not, pleonexia or pleonexi. It comes from pleon and echein, which means to have more. Somebody that wants to have more and more and more. Somebody that wants to, to get, to grab, especially something that is not his, not belong, does not belong to him or her. Let it not even be named or mentioned among you. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, for those that are set apart. There are things that are fitting for saints and there are things that are not fitting for saints. And Paul says fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness no, that doesn't fit. Porneia, the word for fornication, is the word from which porn and pornography comes into the English language. Now, that generally speaking means illicit sexual activity. It includes, but it's not limited to pornography. But it seems to me that all three of these concepts together refer to the same conglomerate of sexual content or connotations. Because fornication or porneia and all uncleanness that are associ is associated with that and covetousness, which means somebody that wants more and more and more, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. See, we live in an age where we are constantly told that everything and anything goes as long as you stay away from S. TD. As long as you stay healthy, you are good to do whatever you want to do. And you know, this is a false conception sometimes even among Christians. When uh, Christians argue that all you should focus on is healthiness. If you go and look, for instance, in Leviticus chapter 18, where there's a whole list of uh, sexual behaviors that God does not approve and calls them abomination, doesn't like them, you will see that in that context, and you will see that at the beginning of chapter 19, the argument that God gives there is not stay away from these things so that you will be healthy. Does anybody know what is God's argument? Stay away from these, why? So that you will be, oh, that's it, holy. Holy, be holy because I am holy, set apart. And interestingly, I'm just mentioning this to, to open up our understanding a little bit. The same principle applies even to clean and unclean. We often have used the argument, we don't eat pork, camel, and rats. Because we want to stay what? Healthy. If you read... Leviticus chapter 11, you will see that God never mentions 
Stay away from these things so you will be healthy. What does he say? Stay away from these. Why? So that you will be holy. I'm not saying that healthiness is not somehow connected or even included in holiness. But what I'm saying is that again and again, God emphasizes the importance of holiness. He or she who is in a love relationship with God, the focus is not primarily healthiness, but rather holiness. You know, as parents, and I am starting getting to that stage of life, we have to learn how to handle the sexual curiosity and even urge of our children. They are curious. Does anybody know why they are curious? The most common answer is hormones, Pastor, hormones. Yeah, that too. But then they also see how curious adults are. Because even the computer, when something is problematic there, they will say, this is for adults. Really? Then I want to be an adult and know what that is. Yes, we, we have to learn because what Hollywood calls making love may be radically different from what the Bible calls to be the flame of Yahweh. That's how the Bible calls romantic love, flame of, flame of Yahweh. And I would like to recommend this book to you because there are stuff that I cannot preach here publicly for some reasons. Because there are different stages of understanding and you don't want to discuss everything in open air when the kids are too small. So that's why I want to recommend this book written by a very well-known scholar, Richard Davidson from Andrews University, Flame of Yahweh, Sexuality in the Old Testament. He also has a pretty comprehensive chapter on sexuality in the New Testament, but his area of expertise is the Old Testament. And indeed, if you want to understand the role of sexuality, you have to start in the Old Testament. You have to start with the frame, with the existential frame in which God gives this gift to be enjoyed in an existential frame ordained by Him. And to know what frame that is, just go to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, verses uh, 20. 3 and 24, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, says Adam, when God brings Eve to him. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of men, and the Hebrew is Isha, taken out of Ish. And then verse 24 says, therefore a man, an Ish, shall leave his father. Please notice, man. The Bible never says that the Isha will leave father and mother. The Bible says that the man will leave father and mother. As long as a man has the ability of leaving father and mother, there may be good chance to cling to his Isha, and they shall become one flesh. Then the Apostle Paul expands a little bit on it and uh, makes it specific in verse 4, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. He says, neither, so this neither indicates that this comes in the same line of thought, neither filthiness, which can be translated by obscenity, indecency, nor foolish talking, which is in Greek, Morologia, morology. And this is what morology means in English, the scientific study of nonsense. You didn't know there was that word in the dictionary. Well, 
the scientific study of nonsense or the use of nonsense in this context of sexuality, coarse jesting or crude, vulgar, dirty joking. I love a pun. I love laughing well at some intelligent words put nicely. But sometimes I, I go to find a nice play on words or a pun, and out of 20 puns, 17 are of a certain nature. I think it's important for us for a good smelling, sweet smelling aroma to do that self searching and see do we line up with that same kind of joking, at least sometimes, which are not fitting. They're out of place, that's the Greek. They're out of place, but rather giving of thanks. And the giving of thanks is eucharistia in Greek. What's the word you get from there into the English language? Eucharist. Do you know what the Eucharist is? Well, the most common usage of the term Eucharist is uh, another word for the Lord's Supper that some historic churches use. But Eucharistia or Eucharistia comes from giving thanks because you know the procedure when Jesus took the, the bread, he, what, what did he do? He thanked God or he blessed and then broke it. So that's where it comes from. But this is what Paul says. It's important for people to give thanks. And giving thanks in this context. Because what Hollywood and Bollywood presents today can easily be unrealistic, unreasonable, and therefore unfulfillable as well. And sexuality quite often is not enjoyable to some people just because they have unrealistic, unreasonable, and therefore unfulfillable expectations. So to cultivate thankfulness in this area, says Paul, is essential. And I don't want to downplay on the importance of learning what it means in biblical context to enjoy this gift, this God-given gift to be enjoyed in a God-ordained existential frame. So Paul then goes back to what he said before, verse 5, verse 5, for this, is, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater. So this kind of person Paul calls idolater. Why? Because it seems that somebody that is a fornicator and does uncleanness and is covetous more and more and more, just want more and more, is an idolater. Why? Because for that person, his own passions or the satisfaction of his or her own passions seems to be the supreme God or goddess. And it's a worship of an idol. Who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Verse 6. Let no one, says Paul, deceive you with empty words. For because of these or such things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And the concept of wrath appears here for the second time in Ephesians. First, it appeared in chapter 2, verse 3 as children of wrath. Therefore, do not become partakers, co-participants with them. So now I want to ask you, this wrath of God that the Bible mentions, is that something that happens now or is going to happen in the future? 
Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God, what? Is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. So is the wrath of God future? According to this passage, it says that it is revealed. Go on, Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 26, 28. Look what happens to those that hold down or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. God gave them over to a debased mind to those things which are not fitting. And sometimes you may hear about shameful things that some people do, and you think, well, that is worth of God's wrath, when in fact, those are, in a sense, God's wrath, because God gave them over to their sinful passions. But there's also in the Bible mentioning about the wrath to come. For instance, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, wrath to come, or the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 6. That wrath is in the future. Whenever somebody speaks about the wrath of God, some other people may be scared and think, oh my goodness, so this is what awaits me? Oh no. Look what Paul says in uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, for God did not appoint us to wrath. No. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That is what we should be focusing on. Because Jesus Christ's life was like a bouquet of lilies of the valley. His death was like a sweet-smelling aroma of self-sacrifice, of giving up himself. And through him we obtain salvation. But how do we obtain salvation? Through disobedience or in obedience? The Apostle Paul continues... And uh, he adds one more picture to it. Walk in good works. Walk in truth. Walk worthy of your calling. Walk in love. And now he says, walk as children of life. He spoke about the children of disobedience. He spoke about those that go against the works of the light. And they are of the darkness. He says, walk as children of life. How? He continues, verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit, or of the light, some translations have light, some have spirit, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. In other words, whatever you do, ask yourself, is this good? Is this right? Is this true? Finding out, he says, or discerning what is acceptable or well-pleasing to the Lord. Finding out, discerning. Listen to me carefully, especially the younger generation. In order for you to discover which bottle, which spray bottle, is indeed a sweet-smelling perfume, you don't have to walk into the store and take all the bottles and try them out. You understand what I'm saying? Trying out all the bottles, all the spray bottles in the store may be even dangerous. It can even kill you. One of my younger brothers, I'm not going to say which one, because now you will know too much about them. Seeing that we have bottles that we use and spray on our bodies, he wanted to do the same. 
be imitators. Whom do you imitate? And do you have discernment? So one day he was walking around and he found a bottle that had a sprayer on it and started spraying the content on him. And then he came and said, can you smell? I have perfume. What he did, he took the fly killer and put it on himself. Could have been fatal to him as well. So what I'm emphasizing here is discernment, finding out what is acceptable, what is well-pleasing to the Lord. Because, yes, God wants your holiness. God wants you to be different, to obey Him and be different. But at the same time, in that holiness, there is a compartment called healthiness as well. You have to discern. Why do you have to discern? Because salvation doesn't happen as an automatic reality that cancels out your willpower. Please notice this. Some people may have false expectations from the process of salvation or from the process of becoming holy just like God because they think once I'm giving my heart over to Christ, Christ will take over and then it's not my decision, it's His decision. Well, yes and no. Let me say how yes and how no. Yes, in the sense that as long as you submit your willpower to His willpower, then yes, He decides, but He would not decide against your willpower. And no, it's not Him in the sense that He cancels out your willpower. No. Whoever wants to pick the right perfume, so to speak, has a say. Yes, the perfume of life, the perfume we diffuse in this world. And uh, I want to illustrate this. Believe it or not, this is a diffuser. Yes, we are diffusing. It comes from the inside. It's not applied on it. It comes from the inside. But in a human being, when a human being gives his own or her own life over to Jesus Christ, there's an interaction, a transformation of, say, the chemicals within that human being. And that's how joining together human willpower Submitting it to divine power, that's how you will become a diffuser of sweet-smelling aroma. Verse 11, this is what it says. And have no fellowship or share in no company with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Expose them or reprove or rebuke or call them out. And this, is, this sounds strange. What does that mean? Should I become a marketing manager for the devil and publicize and uh, advertise for the unfruitful works of darkness, take them to social media and everywhere, let everybody know who's doing what? I don't think that's the point here. That would be one extreme. But at the same time, there's another extreme in which we are told, and I am told, keep silent, don't say a word. Act as if nothing happened. You know, for quite some time, we could hear about um, sexual abuse in church settings. Catholic church had huge scandals. More recent times, the Southern Baptist Convention, that's out in the air. Everybody knows about what is going on. And you may think, okay, so now Seventh-day Adventists? We don't have any scandal? And if we don't, is it because we don't expose 
those unfruitful works of darkness or because we cover them? By definition, light exposes. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Yes, those things are done in secret. Well, some of them, because we've reached a place where many things are done in the open. And don't be judgmental, don't say a word. Well, light, says Jesus, reveals, exposes. Look at John chapter 3. It says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be what? What's the word there? Just move one slide. Exposed. See? And verse 21 says, But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And the Apostle Paul brings it to a conclusion in this section, that all things that are exposed are made manifest, made visible by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. A better translation is everything that is illuminated becomes light. It's like the sun illuminating the moon, and therefore the moon also shines. It is God illuminating you, and therefore you shine, and you illuminate somebody else, and they will shine. And verse 14, therefore he says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. That's the role of this Christian, part of Christ's body. That's my role. That's your role in today's society. Sweet smelling aroma, perfume, light that illuminates and makes other people also shine. There is a beautiful story told by Rita Snowden. She's an English writer, and she says she was visiting a little town, Dover, in England, and as she was drinking her five o'clock tea one afternoon, she started smelling a beautiful fragrance in the air, and she felt like she was in a beautiful flower garden. And she thought, what is this about? And she asked the owner of that little cafe, and the owner said, you know, there is a factory, a perfume factory in this little town, and now the ship goes out, and people carry the perfume they have been preparing inside the factory with them outside. This is a perfume factory factory here and we are taking the perfume of Christ with us to society the apostle paul says in the second corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 god through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Jesus, His way, and Him being the way, is that perfume that people need. And that makes the difference between those who are saved and those who perish, depending on their reaction to it. John chapter 8, verse 29. And he who sent me, says Jesus, is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Let me ask you, if there is any word in this Bible verse that I should underline, which one would that be? And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I 
always do those things that please him. What word should I underline? Which one? Which one? Please. Good, good, good point. Please. I would choose always. Because the problem of a Christian is not please. A Christian usually wants to please God. Sometimes. Maybe even most of the times. The big challenge of a Christian is not just to please God, but it is to always please Him. Always? Yes, always. Can I? No, you can't on your own. But if you submit your will to His will, not to cancel it out, but to shape it, to mold it, to transform it, and take it in the right direction, yes, you will be able. Always? Mm -hmm. Always. Always.